I'm Eric Barnes of The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. Today, we're talking about the importance of parks and public spaces with Noel Durant, the Tennessee Director of Trust for Public Land. So stay with us for a conversation with Noel. Noel, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. Um, A quick, really simple question. Why are parks important? Well, parks are important for a variety of reasons. They make us healthier, physically and, and mentally. Uh, they're what we think of as critical infrastructure for thriving cities. Uh, they're places where you get to know your neighbor, where you can be physically active, that can um, help communities grapple with the growing effects of a changing climate. They can cool surrounding neighborhoods. They can capture storm water. And we view them as a, as a core solution for how a city can grow in its uh, its strength, both with physical infrastructure and social infrastructure. And parks are the intersection of those two things for, for cities across the country. And you all work, you're, uh, we'll talk more over, but Trust for Public Land is a national organization. Do I have that right? We are. Yes, yeah. we're a national organization in our 50th year. And one of the very few national conservation nonprofits focused on the intersection of people and the natural world. So we create parks and protect land for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities for generations to come. Yeah. Um, the, the Memphis is, y'all, y'all did a park score, a, a kind of a ranking and some looking at sort of investment and accessibility of parks. Um, one, it, one of the interesting things is Memphis, you know, I'm what, 25 plus years um, in Memphis. And certainly in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been this huge emphasis from where we were in terms of public spaces to where we are now. And, you know, most visibly Shelby Farms and the Green Line and Wolf River Green Line or Greenway, excuse me, and bike lanes that we didn't have. And, you know, the massive investment in Tomley Park and the riverfront, all the riverfront parks or most, excuse me, I should say most of the riverfront parks, not all of them. Overton Park Conservancy, um, all that. It's been um, a kind of a sea change for a lot of people. And yet still, we're not, I don't know that anyone thinks we're where we want to be in Memphis. And then when you all look and compare to other cities, you highlight some of the challenges and some of the successes. So t- talk about what you all fi- found from an outside point of view when you came in and looked at the parks and public spaces here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll probably just share briefly. So Park Score is a, a survey of the 100 most populous cities in the country as it relates to uh, their park systems based on five key factors. Park access, park equity, park acreage, park investment, and park amenities. And so each of those elements combined makes up the city's park score. And uh, what we have been finding, I think with Memphis, actually, uh, one of the most compelling stories out of park score this year, I think, is Memphis. And its increase in spending on parks. Over the last five years, Memphis has doubled the amount of money that it spends per resident on its park system. And that is astounding based in in a national, when we look at the survey of those 100 park score cities. And so as a result, Memphis has jumped 14 points in ranking uh, to 79th this year from, I guess that was 93rd last year. So that's a really remarkable number. Um, where Memphis lags in, uh, as it relates to other park score communities is that walkable access to parks. The uh, auto-dependent nature of much of uh, Memphis's growth patterns makes it really challenging to create walkable access to parks. Uh, so that's one of those areas that's, a, uh, I think, both a challenge and an opportunity for increasing park access for Memphis. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And, and then... Another piece that's actually a really interesting story, a through line for Park park Score nationally is playing out in Memphis as well. And we've seen mid-sized cities across the country really ratchet up their their park spending. Um, At the same time, we have not really seen equitable park access grow at the same rate. So many communities are investing in parks. Often they're investing in those signature parks, those downtown parks, and neighborhood park access is lagging 
in comparison to park spending. That said, uh, knowing what's coming down the pike for Memphis in terms of neighborhood park investments that are in design process. Currently, there's more good to come for Memphis's park scores in future years. But that this year's snapshot is an interesting one because it aligns really well with what we're seeing in other communities. Yeah. Folks increasing their spending, but there is a, there's still a very high need to be increasing spending around equitable access to parks. Yeah. It is. Interesting. I mean, it's an interesting time with the, the without getting too wonky. I mean, but um, and again, I should tell everyone we're talking to Noel Durant, the Tennessee director of trust for public land today, um, that the um, investments uh, accelerate Memphis, which is a big two hundred million dollar fund that the the city of Memphis in a debt restructuring uh, was able to generate. It's not all going to parks, uh, but it's going a bunch of it's going to parks. So neighborhood level parks are getting some real needed, you know, upgrades. Um, and I believe, I mean, the Hyde Foundation, which has been a huge uh, a supporter of all kinds of things, including this radio station, including Daily Memphian, but Overton Park, the Green Line. Shelby Farms, uh, the River Park, you know, Memphis River Parks Partnership, and Tomley Park, all that stuff. Just, I'm not sure that would have happened without the the support of the Hyde Foundation. Um, they've really wanted to also, besides doing the big signature projects, is find ways that that neighborhood level to have those parks. Um, I, I'm curious when you talk about, you know, Memphis is challenged by this the the size of Memphis, and it's a thing some people have heard us talk about at Daily Memphian or uh, so on, but it. For those who don't know, I mean, Memphis is one of the physically, like geographically biggest cities in the country. It is. And so its population is very midsize, but its geographic population is massive because of the way growth happened and annexation and all kinds of things. And so these challenges around um, – it's interesting. You know, the accessibility of parks is a, cha- is a result of that. also means it's harder – uh, there's well, far more roads in Memphis, you know, per capita to keep up with just infrastructure. Things are more expensive here or more of a hassle here. That's a technical term um, for for dealing with all kinds of things. You know, um, the, the dispersed, I mean, ma- public transit is a challenge in all mid-sized cities, I think, but it's even more so here because we're so spread out. So you, the bus routes have to go even farther and so on. I am curious though, for are there other mid-sized cities with, you know, I mean, Road, dependence on roads is not uniquely Memphis, right? I mean, it's a it's a very much an American thing in the way cities were made and remade. Um, have other cities sort of conquered the or made headway in the the walkable access challenge in uh, over the years? You know, it's a it's a great question. Yes, they, they're uh, cities have made turn the corner. I'll, I'll use one example uh, of of Dallas, Texas. So Dallas in 2014. They made a commitment to the 10 minute walk, which is a, a national campaign around walkable access to parks. And as a part of that commitment, uh, elected officials said, you know, parks are not just a nice to have, parks are a right as a, a resident of, of Dallas. And they have made some significant and comprehensive investments in park access uh, to the tune of increasing walkable access to a park by 20% over the last nine years. So for Dallas, that's around 300,000 residents gaining access to a park over nine years, which is Huge. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and for a, a community like Dallas that's experiencing a lot of rapid growth and a lot of inequitable investment, the, the, the park strategy that they've been deploying is integrating both traditional sort of greenfield park investment, if you will, where you buy a buy a parcel that's vacant, convert that into a park, but also looking at uh, dovetailing park access with other uh, civic infrastructure, primarily schools, and how school access for community use uh, is a critical tool that we're seeing being deployed across the country. Some other notable examples uh, of cities who have used that strategically to increase their park score would be this year, Boise, Idaho jumped 15 spots utilizing a community use agreement for park access. Last year, the city of Cincinnati uh, jumped from uh, eight to four in park score through a community use agreement uh, approach. So there's um, there are some interesting opportunities to increase walkable access to parks through somewhat non-traditional methods. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, generating the most impact are these partnerships for park access 
that can operate at the city scale and not just one yeah. park at a time. It was interesting. I was reading a bit about about that. Um, so let's talk more about using you know schoolyards or, or playground. You know the the existing school spaces. It, I mean, it's kind of obvious when once you say, "Hey, those are sitting unused," or you know, during the summer, or there. But it, what does it come down to? Does it come down to taking the locks off the gates? Does it come down to staff and maintenance? Does it come down to bathroom facilities? I mean, what are the sort of the things you have to do to make that possible? Uh, there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of avenues that communities might take. Uh, one of which would be a partnering agreement around use of these school sites for community use between a parks department and uh, the Department of Education or the Board of Education, depending on how uh, the school districts are structured. Um, and that usually involves a level of partnership where the school says, yes, we're willing, the school district says, yes, we're willing to provide community access, but we need support for ongoing maintenance uh, for this additional wear and tear or uh, we, we could really use some capital investment to improve some of these facilities to better tailor the site for, uh, for community use. Um, so that's a, that is sort of the joint use agreement where you have two parties who are involved in creating the space. Other, other school districts say, hey, we are ready to do it ourselves. We'll issue a policy statement that says, you know, uh, our community schools are open to the public after hours and we sort of take that on individually. Um, but it, I think it's, those are two, those are two pathways that different cities take. Um, and then there's another option that uh, Trust for Public Land has been working on in, in cities across the country, and most notably starting in New York City, where we work alongside a school district and a parks district and often other municipal agencies that have an intersection between, say, stormwater capture or urban heat. And we help design schoolyards that uh, are funded by, say, the Parks Department or Department of Environmental Quality for, for water quality purposes. And they are accessible for the kids, often designed by students, um, so in, informed by community use. So that's a, a model that's a little more, uh, more hands-on. But we're, we're finding for communities across the country that you know, the challenge of operations and maintenance of, of park facilities is immense. And where where there's uh, opportunities for partnership with other agencies of other funding sources, that's been really enabling uh, yeah. to scale park access through through access to schoolyards. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk more about some of those issues and trust for public land and just parks uh, nationally, but let me take a minute here and do a little housekeeping. Um, again, just remind everyone we're talking today to Noel uh, Durant, the Tennessee Director of Trust for Public Land. I'm Eric Barnes, and this is The Sidebar, which airs here on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. It's focused on the community, arts, culture, everything in between. Uh, but it's not just a radio show. It's one of many weekly podcasts we do at The Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, Bill Drees, and sometimes Sam Hardiman's politics. Politics podcast on the record, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies podcast with Chris Harrington and Drew Hill, and Jennifer Biggs and Chris Harrington's food podcast, Soundbites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11, right before the sidebar. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, this one, uh, the sidebar and Soundbites, um, you can also get on the WYXR app or go to WYXR.org. Um, you can also get all the music shows, um, archives of the music shows and the other talk and um, um, chat shows, as they say in uh, London, um, that are available on WYXR. So um, I can do a London reference. We don't have to take that out. Natalie Van Gundy, producer of the show, really worried about a London reference. I mean, it's just, it's going to be fine. It's a chat show. Um, I should also say, um, WYXR, just to remind everyone, it is a nonprofit, listener-supported radio station. So if you can become a member, do go to WYXR.org and click on donate or membership. You can, if you can't afford to be a member and you can give something, that's great. If you can't, just keep listening and uh, spread the word about WYXR. Uh, I should also note uh, Daily Memphian. Um, if you're not a paid subscriber, please do become one. Um, that's how we support what we do with a newsroom of 40 and another 15, 20 freelancers here um, at the Daily Memphian. So please do as we come up, especially uh, our five-year anniversary is coming up in um, September and uh, we continue to grow, continue to add people, hired two people in the last couple of weeks uh, into the newsroom. But we also need uh, to continue 
continue to grow on subscriptions. So um, uh, we appreciate your support there. Um, to that end, I mentioned the five-year anniversary. Um, we have Jeff Calkins coming on. He was there from the very beginning of the Daily Memphian. We'll have some other folks on from Daily Memphian uh, talking about um, this last five years and sort of the wild ride it's been, how it all came about. So we'll be doing that over the course of the summer as we move towards September and our five-year anniversary. Um, I should uh, also note recent shows we did. Um, Otis Sanford was on. Um, Otis is uh, changing up a bit. He's retiring from U of M, but he's still going to be on TV. He's going to be on KNO. He's going to be writing his column for Daily Memphian. And we talked about the state of journalism, some of the reasons why the Daily Memphian was launched. It was a great conversation with Otis. Um, all conversations with Otis, truthfully, are um, great conversations. But uh, that's another show you can get um, uh, on the Daily Memphian site, YXR, or wherever you get your podcasts. We recently also had Keely Brewer on, who covers environment for us as part of the Re- Report for America national program to bring young people, uh, new people into journalism. Um, and I mentioned behind the headlines, which we do at WKNO um, every Friday at uh, seven o'clock. We recently had, um, uh, I can't remember who we recently had because I was on vacation. So we'll have to, I was not even in London. I wasn't even doing a chat show in London, Natalie. Uh, but we do have coming up, uh, the Memphis mayoral candidates. Uh, we have a series of them coming up. The first one, uh, will be Frank Colvett. Um, we've got others coming up down the road through the course of the summer leading towards a, another, uh, mayoral debate, um, in, uh, before early voting begins in the late summer fall. But for now we are here with, uh, Noel Durant, the Tennessee director of trust for public land talking about, um, uh, parks, the importance of parks, changes and improvements that that Memphis has made. One thing I was thinking about um, that um, about parks as I was getting ready for the show, and partly it isn't from because I was just on vacation and I was um, um, in I was I actually happened to be in Europe and I was in France and Spain and there's there's a strange a different kind of feel to the whole public space and parks um, over there in some ways. But I'm thinking about the United States and we kind of have a dysfunctional relationship with parks. I mean, on some level, right? I mean, few people, few people, I know they're out there, but few people don't like parks, right? I mean, they, they like being there. If it's a good park, if it's clean, if they're with their kids, their grandkids, their friends, um, a nice place to sit, a nice place to run around, a nice place to play, a nice place to have a glass of wine, a nice place to have a Coke, whatever it is, people by and large overwhelmingly enjoy that. But we underfund our parks at every level of government, right? I mean, I know there are exceptions to this, but at the national parks are, I mean, almost a victim of their success, right? They're underfunded. Uh, they can't pay for themselves just with ent- entrance fees at the state level, at the local level. W- do you, I mean, that's kind of a, you know, it's a deep question, but why, it, one, do you think I'm right? This kind of, de- dis- too much of a dysfunctional relationship between the citizens and our parks and public spaces. And why is that? As a nation, we don't think as deeply about parks as we need to. And we are not really thinking about those multiple benefits that parks provide, both in terms of their health capacity, their ability for communities to gain resilience. And often when you look at uh, the popular nature of parks as amenities, it's one of those things that many elected officials say, yeah, I hear from residents that they they want to see more park access, but it often falls behind the, the litany of, uh, of needs within a community. The exception to that, I think, is where there are opportunities for residents to choose to vote in support of increasing park access. So that's a, a program. Trust for Public Land has a team called Conservation Finance, and they support communities to generate public funding. Uh, for conservation and park measures across the country. And we've seen immense success over the last nearly 30 years for that program, generating $94 billion across just about every state in the country with a hovering just below a 90% success rate for campaigns taken to the ballot. So that's, and you know, you, you think of some of those legacy uh, funding mechanisms at the national level, like land water conservation funding. I mean, that's generating $900 million a year that is support, uh, bipartisan support for, for this very thing. Um, it is a really interesting conundrum. Um, and often when we see this in communities, there is a desire for more capital investment without the, the, the backstopping of the operating support that are needed to maintain these high quality facilities. And I think if more residents across the country had 
the opportunity to incorporate park access into their daily lives. There would be a more informed uh, grassroots advocacy for maintaining high quality park spaces. There would be more opportunities for cities to realize all of those health and resilience benefits that go along with park spaces. And I, I do think uh, ultimately when we think of uh, big picture public land access, if you're not connected to nature where you live, how are you supposed to care about our national forests, about our national parks? If you don't understand how, how you are in, ingrained into the natural world where you live in, in, in the middle of an urban core of the city of Memphis, or um, if you live in you know, uh, rural Northwest Montana, adjacent to, you know, millions of public acres. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know part of the debate and conversation that happens here sometimes is when, you know, there's uh, a proposal to spend X, Y, Z on um, a park. People are like, well, but we have a crime problem or we have an education problem or, and it becomes an either or kind of problem versus, well, can we do a little bit of all of it? And can we maybe figure out how all those things could work together? You know, and, and I think most people see it that way, but it does become this kind of either or choice, you know, and I think in Memphis on the capital budget, I was looking, this might be a couple years old, but, you know, it's generally about an $85 million capital budget. That's everything from road paving to community centers. I think Memphis, a normal year spends about $2 million on public parks, you know, which is just a tiny, tiny number. I mean, if there aren't public funding, more public funding, whether that's a dedicated tax or that's uh, just, you know, the city council, county commission, whatever you're, you know, um, uh, in, in Memphis, it would be one of those two entities or the state. Um, what about, is there a growth in conservancies? You know, I mean, I'm a, in full disclosure, I'm a former board member and board chair of the Overton Park Conservancy here in Memphis, which was a big, big part of reinvigorating and bringing new life back to that public park. Um, but it was also done as a necessity. I mean, there just wasn't the public funding available to to renovate the park and do some of the improvements. Um, I can tell you it isn't easy <laughs> to run a conservancy. I mean, there are people who are like, oh, we'll just make a conservancy and we'll have a park. It'll be great. Well, it just doesn't work that way. It's hard to raise money. It's There are limited funds within the world of philanthropy. Um, so I, what are the role of conservancies in this kind of situation? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the role of conservancies, especially when you look at those signature park assets, those largest, most visible, uh, those large regional and or signature park spaces, I think conservancies play an absolutely critical role in, in augmenting and defraying some of those significant operations and maintenance costs. And where you have, uh, when you have the patronage of philanthropists who, who know and love that space, it's a critical tool for, for those largest park assets. I think conservancies often would be limited if you're trying to think of the city scale. How can a, how can a conservancy who's very sort of place-based try to scale that work? I mean, there are, um, I, I think of uh, dedicated parks nonprofits in the state of Tennessee. Uh, I look at Legacy Parks Foundation in Knoxville as a great example of a, of a, a citywide philanthropically supported organization working in in tandem with municipal government. Trust for Public Land operates very similar to that with the city of Chattanooga, where we're working at the city scale. Um, but and I do think conservancies play a critical role in maintaining these places that are most inspiring. I think from a nuts and bolts parks access perspective, especially at the neighbor neighborhood level, the conservancy model would be a challenge, I think, to deliver that level of focus in neighborhood parks. Yeah. Uh, where it's more about the sort of core functioning of the park and less about the sort of the, uh, the high design. I mean, what makes, what makes the signature park so inspiring is uh, often you don't need that same level of design to create a really functional neighborhood park asset that's really focused more on the community. How does the community utilize the space? Where are those opportunities for community residents to see themselves, know that they belong in their neighborhood park? And, and see their voice be turned into action to improve uh, neighborhood park access. Yeah. Well, one question, this is just, again, partly influenced by my having just been in Europe, but um, in Europe, you know, there's so many, um, I was in France and Spain and, and there's so many plazas 
right? I mean, these kind of open spaces, they are concrete or they are stone. Um, they are lined by shops, housing, buildings. There is not a play set. There is not a swing. <laughs> there is not, you know, there's not even necessarily a designation of this is the green area you're supposed to, or the green concrete paint where you ride your bike and where you don't. And yet they are, they are, they serve the purpose of being a small neighborhood park. I mean, just kids running around, people hanging out. I mean, is is a plaza a park from the from your I mean, as a from your point of view? Oh, I, I would I would certainly say you know, plazas are the public realm. I um, when we think of a definition of a park, and this is a really squishy one, I, I do think there needs to be uh, the natural assets in place. And I don't I don't know if I mean I uh, I would say a plaza can be park like. But I do think you need to be able to interact with nature for there for it to be uh, a park and uh, high quality public realm plazas and and boulevards. They're amazing uh, city changing assets. I would probably uh, avoid going as far as calling a, a, a hardscape plaza a, a park. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's you know, I, in, in Memphis, I don't know how much time you've spent in Memphis, but I happen to live in Crosstown, and there's a big plaza outside Crosstown with a big splash pad, and the splash pad has all these trees in it, and it's an interesting kind of, and there's these park benches yeah. and so on, but it, that big section is really, it is concrete, you know, and yet there yeah. are people, once they turn that splash pad on, and really it's year round, but especially right now. It functions as a park and it functions very much for a neighborhood park. I would say most of the people who are in that plaza are um, probably not residents, and which is part of what it's for. It's for the neighborhood. So it's not even the arguing. Yeah. I, I, I was yeah. nodding as you were talking no, that's about a, interacting I with nature. You, I think it's again, just an interesting – squishy you know. definition. Yeah. When you start describing a, a splash pad as a recreation amenity, um, I do think that that definitely trends far more onto the yeah. park side than yeah. – than, uh, uh, you know, when, when I visit a plaza, I think of it as sort of the, the hardscape nature of a space that's really right. the the social infrastructure is animating it uh, less than uh, uh, the sort of natural infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left here. One one quick quick question that may or not be a quick answer, but uh, how did you get into this? Why is this uh, your, your work? Uh, I studied natural resources in college. Uh, did a brief stint in wildland fire and realized I wanted to work more on the people intersection. I loved chainsaws, but realized I didn't want to. Who didn't doesn't want to do that love a, a chainsaw? Uh, Come on. Career. Um, and I, I came to Trust Republic Land as a project manager for construction management, but really was uh, gravitated to the, the mission of sort of shaping cities through access to the outdoors, shaping communities. I mean, regardless of the, of the size and scale. Um, so that's how I, I came to trust for public land, and I, I left the organization and came back because I, I viewed the, the the focus of connecting everyone to the outdoors as really the core motivation. I, I thought I, I took my dream job uh, working in a um, a r- small resort community in the, the high Rockies of Colorado, and, and realized I, I actually really care for connecting everyone yeah. to the outdoors, and I couldn't do it there. So. Yeah. Uh, and my last question, I try to ask everybody because YXR is fundamentally a music station. Uh, what was the first concert you ever went to? Oh, gosh, that's a really, that's a really good question. Uh, it was probably uh, Ken Miedema concert in okay. Chattanooga, the Tivoli, like kid song stuff. <laughs> and uh, I, I got called out. He, um, he asked for a you know, someone in the audience to yell at a name of a uh, animal who was going to write a song about it. And so I, I was wearing a shirt that had a sand shark on it and I yelled out <laughs> sand shark and he wrote a song about sand sharks. That's I don't know, it was maybe five, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And then what was the first show that you uh, paid money to go to? Oh gosh. Um, it might've been uh, Tennessee homecoming in high school where huh? I went up there and saw Doc Watson. Play, okay. Uh, in North Tennessee. Nice. Uh, at the Museum of Appalachia. Nice. Uh, That's yeah. a, that is definitely yeah. a first. Definitely a first <laughs> for <laughs> us in a good way. That's good. Um, again, uh, Noel Durant from Tennessee as Tennessee Director of Trust for Public Land. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for uh, talking to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric.
Um, uh, again, this is uh, The Sidebar. It airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. If you missed any of the show today, you can get the full podcast of the interview on the D- Daily Memphian site, WYXR, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please just subscribe to this podcast and our other Daily Memphian podcasts, um, and subscribe to The Daily Memphian um, if you're not already. Um, thanks very much, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>